so good afternoon and uh, here is a warm welcome to this uh, webinar on a very interesting topic that is taking the world by the storm uh, today and uh, it is none other than uh, deep learning which is uh, uh, which is a new technique that is employed in artificial intelligence and a quick introduction of uh, myself uh, my name is sundar ramalingam and i i am responsible for managing the deep learning practice for nvidia in india and i am based out of bangalore uh, and over the next i would say about 20 minutes or so i'm going to give a very quick overview of what deep learning is and what are all the areas uh, in which it is getting applied today and how it is going to change the way technological world and socio economic world is is functioning today so even before i get into that presentation looks like there is a poll we have had a few developments in the technological world which changed the way uh, mankind has been working and and technology has been working uh, over the past few decades the early 90s is when a revolution came in the world and also in our country wherein uh, internet was introduced over the pc and we all know that that has changed the way we are working today and then came the next big revolution exactly 10 years later, which is a uh, uh, mobile and cloud based revolution. And, uh, and uh, I mean, needless to mention, that also has changed the way uh, our lifestyles have been functioning over the past multiple centuries. And the next big wave in, in technology is what is happening today in artificial intelligence. And uh, let us not make any mm, sort of um, mistakes here. Uh, artificial intelligence has been there for long. I mean, in fact, I mean, uh, the, the idea was first conceptualized as early as the, the uh, 1950s. And then in 1980s is when a new technique, which is called as machine learning, was introduced. And uh, uh, that has seen many ups and downs. In fact, um, a lot of interest went into machine learning. And then it saw a sort of attitude in terms of where it can achieve and it never really advanced to the levels of uh, accuracy of, uh, of predictions and other things that, that are expected out of a machine. And then in 2010, I mean, it, in fact, it is it's as late as uh, about 2011 or so that this new technique called deep learning started becoming pervasive. And over the past three to four years, uh, deep learning has evolved as the most disruptive technology that we have ever seen. And deep learning is, uh, in fact, nowadays already being applied or on the verge of getting applied in domains and verticals uh, that we haven't even um, imagined it to be. I will reserve that discussion for the subsequent slides. But it is quite safe to say that every walk of life, everything that human beings to today is going to be touched by deep learning uh, uh, very shortly. And all our decisions, all the predictions that we make, all our financial decisions, anything and everything is likely to be touched by deep learning in the very near future. And very quickly, uh, NVIDIA, the company which for which I am working, uh, many of you might know that it is uh, uh, it started off as a, as a, as a GPU, a graphics uh, manufacturer company. And today, the company has evolved as an AI computing company. And it's not only NVIDIA, um, many of the big names in the world like Google, Facebook, Microsoft, etc., etc. I mean, so many of them are all having a lot of focus and R&D money being pumped into artificial intelligence. Uh, and in particular, deep learning as a technique so um so much about the hype but what exactly is deep learning i will try to explain that in in very simple terms so uh once again to reinforce the idea deep learning is a technique which is employed in artificial intelligence and it involves a lot of data let me explain that with the help of a simple example Say, I mean, we all uh, would have seen uh, children, small children, maybe eight months, nine months old children. How do they learn about objects? For example, let us take the case of an apple. How does a nine month old child 
understand that an apple is an apple that is because it's a father or its mother the child's father or the mother gives him um, a, an apple and uh, uh, and identifies it's an apple so an object is presented to the child and a label called apple is attached to the to the object by the father or the mother and so the human brain is made so fantastic of uh, amazingly um, complex and capable of doing so many things uh, by god that uh, one apple when given to a child uh, is enough to train the human brain uh, to identify the apple the same apple if it is given if it is presented to the child again the next day and it in fact you can go one step further let us assume that the first apple which was used to train the child's brain was red in color of a particular shape and a particular size uh, even the next day even if you give the child another apple which could be let us say green in color and slightly smaller size and slightly different shape then also human brain is able to identify that as an apple so it need not be the same object even a similar object can be identified because of the enormous capabilities of human brain now it is exactly the same approach that is that is used in deep learning the only difference being machines are not so intelligent that they can be trained using one object you have to give a lot of data uh, i mean once again going to the same example like you have to give large very large number of images of apples taken in multiple angles multiple sizes multiple shapes multiple colors maybe with leaves without leaves etc etc so a large number of images labeled images images that have been labeled as apple have to be fed to the computer and then we write algorithms these algorithms what are they capable of the algorithms are capable of learning from the data that is fed to the apple or fed to the system um just like a child learns from the object and the label provided to it, to it the system algorithms also enable the system to to understand the patterns out of the data that is given to it to extract features out of the data that is given to it and hence understand that an apple is an apple and later on if the same if a similar object a similar apple is shown to the machine through a camera or a radar or a lidar depending upon the use case the system will be able to identify new object also as an apple now that is the fundamental approach of deep learning now what i have done here is using when i try to explain this i have simplified it a lot uh, obviously it is not as simple as i sound it off to be but then the, the approach is the right is the same wherein you train the machine by writing algorithms and the training happens through a large amount of data the training happens in two ways number one either by extracting features of the data or by extracting patterns out of the data and understanding the data and predicting in similar data when it is when it is presented to the system it is able to predict what the data is going to be and that exactly is what is called deep learning and in a way the approach to deep learning mimics the way human brain works now so what are i explain to you is uh, uh, is using image image recognition we call it as image recognition there are multiple few a couple of more things also the first one is called as a speech the same logic can be used to to to, to, to do wonders on on speech and the next one is what is called as natural language processing which again is a is a, is a very advanced technique uh, wherein you are able to make sense out of uh, sceneries or or long sentences etc what are all the areas where deep learning is applied today or is likely to be applied today the answer is almost everywhere that's the beauty of the science i will pick up uh, a few top uh, domains in which deep learning is getting applied 
And the top amongst them is the image classification and object detection, which I explained just now. Say, for example, um, I mean, the way e-commerce sites are working today, like you want to go and buy um, a shirt in a in an e-commerce from an e-commerce site the way human behavior is modeled and the way uh, suggestions are made to you is, is going to change a lot thanks to deep learning and not only that i mean um, classification of images say for example uh, you have a large a very tall windmill uh, that is operating and uh, you can send a drone which is an intelligent drone a small drone very small drone that can go whatever might be the height of the windmill and go and find out if there are any cracks or if there's any rust that is developing on the blades of the of the windmill that is also uh, uh, that will also fall under the category of uh, object direction action recognition say for example uh, there is a branch called as intelligent video analytics iva which is used a lot in security and surveillance um, uh, uh, to tell an example I mean, inside an ATM chamber, let us say, uh, somebody goes and pulls out his wallet from his trouser pocket. That's a very normal thing. No alarm should go off. But let us say, instead of a wallet, if a person pulls out a weapon from his trouser pocket, then that obviously is a is a, is a grave concern. Uh, I mean, there is no reason for somebody to pull out a weapon inside an ATM chamber. Uh, so that that should raise an alarm, and a, a, and immediately a trigger should go to the control room police control room all these things can be identified using deep learning um one more example could be um let us say uh, the the periphery of a of a secure area like like say an airport or a of a, or a high security building etc if somebody tries to scale the the wall of the secure area and tries to jump into the other side of the building other side of the wall then cameras that are uh, Monitoring the, seats, the, 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 the perimeter and identify this incident and immediately raise an alarm. See, one thing I want you to understand is that we are not talking about an incident or a bad incident that has already happened. And then people go and look at the video footage and find out who is the person who jumped the wall or in what time did he jump the wall. That is not what we are talking. We are talking about identifying incidents as and when they happen if somebody is trying to jump the wall or if somebody is trying to pull out a weapon from his trouser pocket as and when that happens the cameras will be intelligent to identify that it has happened and raise an alarm that is what we are talking about when it comes to intelligent video analytics the second one is speech recognition speech translation and natural language processing once again, as I speak, let us say I am talking in English now, and you want to listen to my talk in 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 the local language like Telugu or Hindi or Marathi or, or Tamil. I mean that can be done using deep learning, and these are all things that are actually happening in the world today. And uh, um, autonomous vehicles, once again, um, pedestrian deduction, lane deduction. We we hear a lot of exciting things about how cars are becoming uh, more and more autonomous. Uh, I think, uh, particularly in the development stage, and I'm sure in the near future, they will be rolled out on the roads as well. In many developed countries, they are already uh, available today. So, how does uh, um, how do autonomous vehicles drive themselves? How do they know what is when whether they are inside the lane and when they have to change the lane? If they have to merge with an existing traffic, how do they know? How do they recognize a red light? How do they recognize the traffic? signs on the road the speed limit or the gesture by a policeman a traffic policeman is, is standing on the road and is showing his hand which means the vehicle is supposed to stop how does the autonomous vehicle understand these things all these things are possible using deep learning and lot, last but not the least healthcare is, is a major focus area for deep learning there are many areas like uh, breast cancer cell deduction volumetric brain segmentation, uh, diabetic retinopathy, digital radiology, x-rays, CT scan analysis, etc., etc., are, which are get fast getting replaced with machines, which, which, uh, which, uh, which, which help in, in identifying or in, in the screening and identification of diseases. And 
you never know uh, maybe in the future uh, future radiologist will be a machine uh, to start off with and the diagnosis might be approved by a human being instead of the human being human radiologist doing every diagnosis himself or herself so to sum up all everything that we are doing today is going to change almost everything is going to change thanks to deep learning technologies now those are the general generic applications of deep learning um next question would be where are they applied in the geospatial area in satellite imagery i mean that's a very important uh, application for deep learning and the 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 applications of geospatial imagery satellite imagery directly touches human lives i have given six examples of or use cases where deep learning is applied in a geospatial world the first one is poverty prediction this is an actual study done by stanford university wherein they analyze the satellite imagery and the, the pattern of uh, lighting uh, overnight uh, over the night conditions uh, from satellite picked up some satellite imagery and they and they sort of predict how uh, uh, an area which is stricken by poverty how is it going to expand what is the direction in which it is going to move etc and then ecological uh, imbalance say for example some the course of of, of a river suddenly changes or um, one more thing uh, monitoring of deforestation uh, like satellite satellites pick up a lot of images all through the all through the day and in a, in a densely forested area let us say if a smoke comes from a particular patch of the forest who has the bandwidth to 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 look at images and identify that there is a deforestation effort happening there and go and take corrective actions it cannot be done manually right i mean there are so many satellites capturing so much images how do you identify that a small patch uh, smoke is emanating from a small patch all those things can be done very quickly done through deep learning techniques wherein uh, a smoke that is coming from from one particular patch of the forest can be identified from satellite imagery and immediately a trigger can happen uh, spread of epidemics like um, say for example there are very bad epidemics like cholera malaria etc depending how how do you expect uh, these epidemics to spread in what direction at what rate etc how are they expected to spread and hence take preventive action to stop them from spreading geological disaster recognition once again very similar to, to to the deforestation one which i which i talked about like there are indicators of of some impending disaster that is going to happen how do you pick up those indicators from satellite imagery using machines and not through manual uh, viewing manual viewing is obviously very complex and, and, and error prone how do you monitor those things 24 by 7 day and night using machines and hence make these predictions more accurate that can be done through deep learning and location intelligence this sort of ties back to the autonomous vehicles satellite imagery can be very effectively used to increase uh, the locational intelligence so and where exactly are you driving how many um what's, what is the traffic ahead of you what is the pattern of the road how is it going to change are there any constructions happening on the road all these things can be recognized and the right action can be can be taken when, when an autonomous car is moving over a particular patch of uh, area so uh, once again particularly when it comes to gis deep learning touches human lives in a big way so that is what i wanted to cover in this short 20 minutes that i have been given and uh, my credentials are given here i mean feel free, i mean you can feel free to write to me if you have any questions uh, you can send me an email and i'll be very happy to answer them further and uh, i over to you Hush. thank you mr sundar i now uh, request professor arudas gupta to take over the presentation i'm going to talk uh, a little in general uh, uh, looking at uh, some of the uh, other aspects the social techni technical aspects of uh, artificial intelligence because as you've heard from uh, sundara that uh, 
the deep learning is one aspect of artificial intelligence. If we look at uh, the canvas of artificial intelligence, then we can see that uh, if you look down at the uh, bottom left, you will find deep learning. Okay. And you see a little symbol uh, like a triangle arrow. And if you look at the top, you will find that that indicates a three to five years uh, to reach to the next phase. So deep learning right now is in the creation phase and the next phase is going to be the survival phase. Now, there are many other uh, uh, other uh, applications that you can see. For example, if you look at right at the top uh, and you see uh, there is something called decision management, right? And this is right at the equilibrium point. And at some point of time, that means it is quite mature. And then at some point of time, it, its importance is going to go down because other technologies are going to take, uh, come up. In fact, if you look at the red line uh, right at uh, the lowest of the three curves, you will find there there's something called swarm intelligence. And that's right at the creation stage. And that has a time to reach the next phase as five to 10 years. So you see that when we talk of artificial intelligence, we are talk, really talking of a large number of technologies. And each technology has its own place in the, uh, the ecosystem, as well as it has its own uh, time scale in which it is going to achieve the next stage in the ecosystem. So this is what we are really looking at in terms of the artificial intelligence in totality. If we now look at how uh, these artificial uh, intelligence technologies have been adopted, then you will not be uh, surprised to see that already 38% uh, of the enterprises are using artificial intelligence in some form or another. And by uh, 2018, uh, this study, which has been done by uh, the Forrester Research, uh, we, by 2018, uh, it will go up to 62%. And one of the main uh, places where uh, AI is being used is in automating manual tasks. And that's 26%. And using predictive analysis, and this is very important. That's in the previous example, you saw, in the previous speaker, you saw examples of uh, looking at disaster areas, you know, looking at uh, how an automotive, uh, how a, how a uh, driverless vehicle can decide when to brake, when to accelerate. So these are all examples of predictive analysis. And you have 58% of the applications really going into that. Automated reporting and communications are under 25%. That's where uh, machines are able to report their status automatically to their base stations. And an important point is that Big data users, many people are using big data, particularly in the business industry, as well as in the geospatial industry. And they also use some amount of artificial intelligence. That number is very high, 95%. And that is expected because big data really is where you really get into the field of, uh, of deep learning and artificial intelligence. So if we, but then everything is not so nice and bright. There are still people about 20% who have not adapted uh, these technologies. And why? 42% of, of them say that we don't have a business case. That's, we just don't know whether we can use it or not. Another 39% say there is no clarity regarding the usage. Okay, I want to use it, but how? Then uh, another 29% basically they lack the infrastructure. They don't have a modern data management platform and therefore they are unable to use this technology. Uh, you don't have enough people with skills, say 33% of that people, and you don't have enough budget, say 23% of those uh, uh, people. 19% also say that, we okay, we want to do AI, but what are the resources that we need? That means they are really uh, at that level. And 13% say that, okay, fine, but we don't have the right processes or the right governance in our organizations. And about 8% say that data is not really available for, for us to get into AI. Okay. And of course, there are those who just don't believe in AI. Uh, fortunately for us, there are not so many. 14% uh, people feel that artificial intelligence is not proven. 11% of the people think, oh, that's a lot of hype. And 
about 3% go to a much more fundamental level and say, what does artificial intelligence mean? So you see, uh, although this is a technology which has been going on since the 50s and which has now matured um, to an extent uh, in terms of uh, you know the decision making and so forth and then you have something like deep learning which is now uh, looking very very promising and people are big, beginning to use it but at the same time you do have people who either uh, don't believe it at all or people who are still not convinced that they need to get into it so this is the kind of situation that we have but we really need to look at what is the value proposition that artificial intelligence is bringing to the board and you can see that 38% is the prediction of activities related to machines, customers, or business health. So therefore, 38% of the time, you're looking at AI to tell you what is the situation and what is likely to happen over time to your basic resources. And our, if we are talking in terms of business, in terms of what, which way will your customers go? Uh, for example, uh, look at the case of photography. Uh, there was a time when Kodak was raining high because film photography was the thing. And uh, Polaroid came into the picture with instant photography. But today, you have forgotten both these companies. Kodak has, Polaroid has closed down, Kodak has closed down. What has happened is that digital technology has taken over and you have digital cameras. Now, one could look at this in, in terms of deep learning and, and one could then do a prediction as to what would happen to the technology as it is progressing. We can look at geospatial itself. There are many areas in geospatial today which people are talking of. Uh, for example, nobody talked of big data with geospatial, but today people are talking of big data with geospatial. Nobody talked of social media as a ge geospatial data source, but today people are using geospatial as a data source. People are talking of blockchain. And recently I came across a presentation where they are showing how blockchain can be used in handling of geospatial data. So these are the kind of things that are happening and one needs to look at how the things are progressing in order to be able to predict and make a prediction as to what is going to happen in the future. Another 27% are people are looking at automation of manual and repetitive tasks. And this is really what is happening in the IT world today and definitely uh, in the geospatial world. A lot of the, uh, what we normally call as bull work or donkey work, but which has to be done, things like digitization and so forth, are becoming more and more automated. And here is where again, uh, a deep learning or artificial intelligence can come into play and take those kind of decisions in the digitization process, which earlier would require the automatic digitization to stop and then refer to a human intervention to say, do I connect this line to this or do I connect this node to that node? So this kind of automation is also very much there, 27%. Another 14% are looking at uh, monitoring and alerts to provide assessment on the state of your business. Okay, So this also applies, for example, to disaster. That's what's going to happen. Uh, if, if, for example, uh, in India today, we are worried that the monsoon is not going to come on time or is going to fail. Why? Because if the monsoon fails, then you have a problem with agriculture and so forth. Now, this looks pretty, uh, pretty, uh, you know, far-fetched, right? Is it far-fetched? No, because if the monsoon fails, the crop fails. So the crop insurance people have to know how much to charge in terms of premium for a particular crop season and a particular crop. And that information they can only do if they do a deep learning analysis of the past events and the situations currently which can indicate through the past events what is it likely to be in the current season. Okay, then there are of course many other applications. Uh, for example, 7% uh, uh, are re recommendations related to internal issues. 10% uh, are increasing the quality of communication with customers and so forth, but we need not stress on this. These three are the main value propositions. Predictions, automation, and monitoring and alerts. Okay, if this be the case, now there are major issues which come on. For example, if we are talking of automation, there is an issue of loss of jobs. 
and that means you have to do reskilling in fact now people are calling them as new collar workers you have blue collar workers you had white collar workers and now you are going to have a new bunch of people called the new collar workers who are going to actually look into these kind of ai related jobs so on the one side there will be a loss of jobs because repetitive jobs are going to be automated but then those who are losing the jobs have to be reskilled then uh, in case uh, one of the biggest issue is the transparency in ai based decisions for example a, a doctor may use an ai to come to a particular diagnosis but does the patient understand why this particular decision has been taken there is a need therefore to have a transparency in this kind of decision making then there is a need to model a uh, combined physical and social systems why because many of the things that the ai does for example you take the uh, digital the, the cars you know self driven cars okay so that is one part of the technology you model the road the uh, the other features on the road people other vehicles and you move your car but then does it fit into the kind of social system that you are uh, trying to operate the car in so for example you can think of say a a a a a car uh, uh, in in san francisco a self driven car okay but you can you think of the same thing if you put it in say a place like new delhi i don't think so then in terms of predictive modeling also the issue is that of models and if your predictions go haywire then it's there's a huge cost associated with it then another problem that comes and this is more from the uh, sociological point of view is the possible misuse of centrally collected data on behavioral control that is people uh, particularly governments uh, partic uh, uh, governments which are very centrally uh, controlled uh, can use this kind of data or collected or people people buying habits people moving habits and then try to control those and this is something that uh, is almost like george orwell's 1984 so this is something that is now become very real because ai is moved forward so much and last but not least are the acceptability of a, uh, of artificial intelligence applications by the public themselves and and the regulations which are related to the application of the ai so technologically there can be many uh, possible applications but then the government also is uh, interested in seeing that all applications should also Uh, uh, uh be regulated such that they do not have unacceptable side effects and therefore the regulatory aspect also is equally important and the governments have to look at these issues so if i look at job losses uh, to, for new collar workers i find that uh, this is in the us study that 16% of the jobs will be replaced by ai by 2025 and there will be 9% new jobs created because of ai now 93% of the trained people feel that they are unprepared to tackle these new technologies that means there is a huge requirement of reskilling and uh, training people in these new technologies and the new jobs will include things like monitoring robots um, you know data scientists who know how to handle large uh, data volumes and how to visualize them how to analyze them how to make sense out of so much of data then there will be automation spe uh, specialists and then also there will be content curators and this is very important because a lot of the information that's going to come is in going to be in various forms and these have to be curated and those which are not relevant have to be moved away and this is again a job where ai is going to play a major role so now let me end with a, a very beautiful study which was done in japan and reported in the technology and society uh, journal of the ieee and this is on perceptions of artificial intelligence by different groups so what uh, the the study did was they defined four different types of groups uh, in uh, japan they, they refer to ai as intelligent machine systems so ims so inter intellectual machine systems is uh, a, the group of people who are working in that area then you have social science and humanities researchers okay they are they, they are the people who are working in that area of social science and humanities then you have those who are say, science fiction writers and then you have the policy makers and last but not least you have the pub general public okay now the way the scoring is done is there are if you see on the uh, bottom of the graph you will find all the areas where ai can can be used 
and what if you see the scale on uh, on the uh, on the y axis you will see it starts at 3.5 and ends at 1 now the scoring is uh, is done this way uh, that if entirely it can be managed by ai then give it a number 4 and of course you will see nobody has really given a 4 and give it a number 1 if it's only doable by humans and of course you find that nobody has given a number one but there are a lot of in-betweens and the in-betweens are interpreted in this way if you give a score of three it means that it is going to be done by ai but with some human intervention if you give it with a score of two then it means it is going to be done by a human but with ai assisting the human okay you see the way it changes only ai ai assisted by humans humans assisted by ai and then ai only now the interesting part here is if you look at the public the the, the orange dots you will find that the public is pretty happy so long as it is things like driving and disaster prevention and military activities and so forth but as it comes closer and closer to individuals like elderly care like health care like child nursing like uh, life event decision making then the public says no I don't want AI. I want AI minimally. On the other hand, if you look at the people who are the in the field of AI, the IMS as it is shown, then you find that they score very high on all of them, right? But even they are a little uh, a low score when it comes to the uh, subjects which are more human related, like healthcare, childcare, and so forth. So this is it gives you in a nutshell a picture of the acceptance of this technology at the level of different kinds of groups of people. And this is what really our AI practitioners will have to keep in mind because it is one thing to look at AI as a purely technological solution and go ahead and implement that solution. It is quite another thing to look at the AI application and the impact that it is going to have on different people and then uh, you know, uh, tailor those applications, maybe tone them down a bit so that they become acceptable to the public. Because ultimately, whatever you want to do with AI, whether it is done by the government, whether it is done by the industry, or whether it is done by individuals, ultimately, impact is there on humans, impact is there on society, and therefore, one has to be looking at as I said in the beginning, a modeling of not only the physical systems, but also the social systems. So with this comment, I'd like to end my presentation. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you. I hope I have been able to make sense of what I mean by socio-technological implications of artificial intelligence. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Das Gupta. We have uh, some polls that we have skipped in the middle. We'll take those polls quickly. The first poll will start on your screen and you can give your opinion. So the first poll is to understand whether the terms artificial intelligence and deep learning are clear to you and you understand the difference between them. And uh, now you can see the percentages on your screen where audience are now saying they understand the terms artificial intelligence and deep learning and the difference between them. The next poll is about whether you understand how AI and deep learning will be useful in GIS. Great to see again, it's going to 77% are now saying that they understand the different, how AI and deep learning will be useful in GIS. Then we'll move to the last question of the poll and then we'll take up the individual questions you have. Then the last question is, what would you do further after learning about AI and deep learning from this webinar? So we have results coming in, it's a mixed response. Thank you very much for your interaction. Now we'll move on to the individual questions being posted by you. We'll move on to the audience questions. The first question is from Luke Y. He says, from my understanding, deep learning is based on data would spatial data infrastructure be one of the main components of deep learning so i'd uh, like to have the intervention of mr sundar and arup yes so uh, deep learning is certainly based on data and without any doubt 
spatial data uh, infrastructure is uh, is one of the main components of deep learning depending upon what application you are deploying it into uh, for example um, spatial data is needed understanding of spatial data and uh, localizing it is needed for autonomous driving for uh, deforestation or uh, and multiple things that we talked about answer is yes professor arup what would you say uh, on the need for spatial data infrastructures as the underlying base for deep learning i agree with what sundar ramalingam says yes deep learning definitely will require uh, spatial data infrastructure uh, for particularly for the curated and the uh, structured data but one of the aspects of deep learning is is the uh, is the unstructured data and it really that's where uh, a lot of information will lie therefore i would say yes definitely sdi is uh, one of the main components but not the only component there are some individual questions that we we'll, would uh, answer separately then this question is for nvidia uh, where uh, dam man is asking what sources would uh, you refer for uh, learning and reading to understand further about ai sure in fact the nvidia website itself if you go to www.nvidia.com and go to technologies under technologies you will see deep learning there are tons and tons of data uh, good data good wealth of information that is available that will help you to get started on on uh, deep learning uh, if you want to understand what exactly is deep learning and what are the approaches what are the methodologies so far as the programming is concerned what frameworks are available how to get started what is the software needs what are the hardware needs create a deep learning um uh, company uh, all those things are available uh, in, in the nvidia website and in addition to that uh, there are a lot of youtube videos uh, then there are coursera material uh, all the common ones which are available on the public domain they offer uh, a lot of information on deep learning so uh, mr sundar does uh, nvidia through coursera provide any specific Uh, MOOC programs for uh, AI and deep learning. Yes. So, if you just want to learn about deep learning, what is deep learning, etc., uh, these are available in public domain. But let us say you want to gain programming expertise in deep learning. You want to understand how to create algorithms for deep learning. Then NVIDIA provides a, 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 a training program which is called as DLI, Deep Learning Institute, uh, Deep Learning Institute by NVIDIA. and that is a structured training program uh, which has uh, multiple modules there are basic intermediate and advanced modules that helps developers to learn deep learning technologies and uh, and start developing uh, algorithms for deep learning okay there's a quick question from vinay mehta uh, to you again mr sundar saying that you only showed one slide on uh, geospatial and ai if there are any further case studies from nvidia on this Yes, I mean there are once again there are lots and lots of case studies. I mean, given the short twenty minutes, uh, I could uh, do justice only to whatever I showed. But uh, uh, there are lots of them available. They are once again available on the NVIDIA website, and you can write to me, and I'll be happy to help you with more if you want. I think we can also have a compiled list on geospatial case studies from you, and we can share uh, with the audience. Actually, that would be more. useful for the audience i guess yeah that would be great harsha thank you and uh, another question is uh, is there a neural network which is different from deep learning i think the question would be like is neural network different from deep, deep learning is what uh, rashid has to ask so deep learning is the technique and the neural networks are used to create deep learning models in fact they are called as deep neural networks dnn to draw a parallel the we all know that the human brain has got a neurons which are connected by synapses and things like that they are called as the neural network the natural human brain and an extension of that or or, or artificial world of that is called as ann which is artificial neural network which is uh, which are algorithms which are written to mimic the human brain and deep learning uses a very specialized methodology which is called as deep neural network uh so if you go and search for dnn or deep neural network you will find lot of information on that 
and uh, so deep neural networks the, the methodology applied in, employed in uh, dnn is that you extract features out of data and hence understand patterns from the data and when a similar data is presented you are able to use that intelligence to to make predictions from the new data so that is the methodology adopted so deep neural networks are part or integral part of deep learning okay another question i think it's uh, for both of you from ishwari how long will it take before deep learning is incorporated into commercial remote sensing softwares what's your uh, prediction mr sundar how long will it take before deep learning is incorporated into commercial remote sensing software i mean my honest answer is i don't know i don't think i have the competency to to comment on it i will let this pass professor aru uh well, it depends you see like a lot of the uh, commercial remote sensing software already includes uh, uh, ann that's artificial neural networks so um uh, the question is how long will it take for deep learning is incorporated i don't i don't foresee uh, uh, deep learning getting incorporated because deep learning is something that you have to evolve so you have to use the neural networks which are there and maybe add on to it and turn that into some sort of a, a deep learning application uh, i do not envisage seeing deep learning as a module which is put in the commercial remote sensing software okay another question uh, arup das professor arup das gupta can answer is uh, if uh, the again the commercial gis softwares like arcgis are uh, ready to be integrated with deep learning or not do you have any answer for this no uh, my answer is essentially the same as it was for remote sensing then uh, another question is on education professor das gupta what kind of education and technical skills one must possess uh in order to work towards ai and gis it's from tanya again uh, basically it's an interdisciplinary kind of uh, kind of uh, thing so definitely you need to have good knowledge of geography uh and a very good knowledge of mathematics uh because uh, all the modeling that you're going to do is really going to be a lot of mathematical models using a, a large number of mathematical tools uh one is of course as mentioned by sundar the uh, the deep neural networks uh, but then it's essentially a mathematical model so therefore one should have very good mathematical skills okay yeah and just to add to professor das gupta i mean uh, 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 working knowledge in python uh, helps but yes. it's not mandatory yeah. if you have uh, working knowledge in python you can pick up the techniques very easily and uh, uh, yeah that, that's that's what i would say yeah uh, yeah i yeah. think the Thank question you. was there from uh, the question was there from an audience called bhagwan i think he says uh we have knowledge of python r etc i think which is best one of them i think you have answered as python would be one of them right thank you everyone for your time special thanks to mr sundar from nvidia and uh, professor rudas gupta from for joining today and uh, letting know our audience about the basics of artificial intelligence and deep learning and how it is relevant to geospatial thank you one and all